And thank you for joining us today for our Native Market Success web series. My name is Brittany Beck with the American Indian Foods Program at the Intertribal Agriculture Council, and I will be hosting this session along with a couple of my fellow team members, Johanna Heron and Latasha Redhouse, who serves as the AIF Program Director. Today, as part of this educational series, we have invited Dustin Finkel with Awaken Foods to speak on product innovation. He will be doing a series of marketing education webinars, and I will uh, let him go ahead and introduce himself after I tell you that he is the CEO of Awaken Foods and has served as CEO for quite a few natural foods brands. He also is a professor at the University of Colorado. Dustin, take it away. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to share um, some learnings on a couple of different topics. Right now, we're going to go through innovation, and I'll start with a little bit about my background. But for those of you watching, we can always just look at this presentation, but hopefully you'll have a chance to check out the other presentations that we're doing because as a complete summary, they really do give a holistic perspective on how to think about marketing, strategy, innovation, advertising, et cetera. So you can kind of get that full robust uh, viewpoint. So to start, you can see a little bit about who I am, why you should listen to me and, or you know, somewhat pay attention to me. I started my career uh, at Goldman Sachs as an investment banker, switched into CPG, consumer packaged goods with experience at General Mills, White Wave, which is now Danone, I launched the first nationwide gluten-free product ever with gluten-free checks and so many more opportunities to work in this amazing field. Currently, I have the opportunity of starting my own company called Awaken Foods, where I took Kapop, Bee Fine Foods and Bubba's and Awaken Food Crafters, which is a manufacturing entity. And we've been uh, recognized as the fastest growing company in Colorado two years running. So it's great. And what I do like to brag about sometimes is my favorite uh, career aspirational goal is that I was on Shark Tank in uh, last year and had the opportunity to present Kapop to the field of sharks. I swam with the sharks, as they say. And so that was an incredible opportunity. I encourage you to watch me make a fool of myself in front of a nationwide audience at some point on YouTube. <laughs> so I'm going to jump right into innovation. And You'll find the opportunity to circle back with me with any questions that you have in the next couple of months, but please try and really digest this. There's great resources here through this presentation, online, et cetera. So why do companies innovate? Well, there's a few different ways that we do, but before I do, I love to share these cartoons that I have. This is from a guy named Tom Fishburne. He actually worked with me at General Mills, left to become a full-time cartoonist, great gig, but he does a really nice way of boiling down these marketing issues into fun pithy ways. So you can see the eight types of in innovation. We got incremental, the bigger comb, line extension, copycat, the watered down, the overcomplicated, et cetera. And we're going to actually go through all of these different issues. And then the seven deadly sins of innovation, the lust, the envy, the gluttony, et cetera. And these are all kind of watch outs that as you think about innovation, even though they're cartoons, they are kind of nice ways to think about your innovation. So why do people innovate? Well, number one is you want to stay ahead of or insulate from your competition. So anything that we do can be thought of as innovation. It can be a new strategy with how we operate as a business. It can be a new flavor. It can be a new to the world product. But all of these things should be geared at driving success for your company. The second one is consumer needs are constantly changing. And you'll see later in the deck, the impact of not staying ahead of consumer trends as they change. And as we all know, trends change so fast these days. We wanna meet consumer needs. We wanna hit new consumer needs. We want to stay relevant as technology changes. Even if you're in the food world, which I'm in, it's not so much technological, but there are better ways to produce. There's more efficient ways to produce. There's more ways to be sustainable, et cetera. We always want to keep adjusting to cultural insights as they change. And of course, we want to make more money. That's always a good thing. And this is can also be seen as taking a current product you have and innovating a better way to manufacturing it, making it cheaper, et cetera. And then sometimes as we're growing, we want to expand into new and growing categories. So we all know, well, I don't know, depending on the age of you guys watching this video, some of you guys might know some of these different things. I love the Blockbuster one. 
I don't know if you guys uh, here, Latasha or Brittany, know about how fun it was to go to Blockbuster on a Friday night. It was like, what new videos are out? That was what was cool back then. Uh, the Walkman Sport. I remember when I got my first Walkman Sport. For those of you who don't know what that is, which is kind of comical to me, it is basically a tape player that you could take portable. It's the new, the old version of the iPad, and then of course borders. These companies did not stay ahead of evolving trends. And as we see the impact, basically, who came in and ate their lunch? Well, Netflix did. Netflix came and saw a migration to initially quick video uh, rentals at convenience locations to digital. What's interesting, and I can update this deck with another crest out through Netflix, because Netflix, while still continuing to do well, has seen Hulu and YouTube TV and others come in and start eating their lunch. On the Walkman, we all know what came in there, the iPods, or I, I don't remember what these were called originally, but I think the iPods. And then, of course, Borders, the company that's taking everybody out of business, which is Amazon. So these are things that companies that were Fortune 500 companies did not stay ahead of trends and essentially lost their key business model. And that's evidence, and I just want to reinforce how important innovation is. You can see that only 53 companies have been on the Fortune 500 since 1955. That's pretty outstanding. If you actually think, look at the chart, it gets really steep. I.e. companies come in and fall off quickly because they do not stay ahead of trends. I do like to note that I've worked for like five of these companies. So, you know, maybe correlation causation, who knows? Anyway, let's talk about how to think about innovation and how we should be focused strategically. This is absolutely critical. And for those of you who have the opportunity to watch the marketing overview, I'll speak a lot more about market segmentation. I'll speak a lot more about target marketing because the number one thing in marketing, hands down, everything should be focused on your target. We talk about in that presentation, how to figure out who your target is, how to do segmentation and whatnot, but you need to understand who your target market is. And to break that down really simply, it's the consumer you're going after. If you try and go after every consumer, you're going to be nothing to nobody versus being something to somebody. It's really, really important to find out what you're best at and who you should be focused on. So marketing and innovation as well should always be focused on the should always be focused on um, your target market. So let's talk about we're going to go through the process and we're going to talk about the new process development. And everything in here is really critical, but how firms go through this process differs depending on how big or how complicated a new product is. So the first is obvious, you need an idea. I would argue this is probably the hardest part of new product idea, of new product innovation, coming up with an idea. That's why people start companies. That's why new products are developed. It's absolutely critical that you have a great idea to move forward with. But how do you know if it's a good idea? Well, the first step is concept testing. We'll talk about what concept testing means, but essentially you wanna take your idea, put it into a format that people can understand and you're gonna test it. This doesn't mean spending millions of dollars. This can be done for free. It can be done with hundreds of dollars. You can really do this with whatever budget that you might wanna go through with. The next one's product development. This is developing prototypes of the product. Then you go back into market testing, launch, and then of course, People think this is where it stops. In fact, I would argue this is almost where it begins because you want to continue to evaluate your results. I'll talk a little bit about the Kapop case study at the end of the company I started, but for the first year and a half, we were constantly innovating around that core product, improving, looking at the results, making sure that we were improving to continue our growth cycle. Now, this process is kind of the perfect version of the world. Many companies will not go through this entire process, and that's okay. Your company, you may not go through concept testing. You might go from idea right into product, right into launch. We want to talk about how we always incorporate some level of testing, but it's really important to think about how you can evaluate the results of your product and make sure you're continuing to improve. Listening to your consumers is so absolutely critical. If you think about how many technological products out there that you must think to yourself like, who was, was there anyone that they actually tested this thing on? Because it's so hard to use. I don't understand. I think about a lot of the furniture that I've built for my kids, that there clearly was not someone trying to actually build the furniture following those instructions because there was not testing on how to execute that. And so some of those things are really, really important to success here. 
Now, the first step is the idea generation, which I talked about is the hardest. Let's talk about some of the ways you can do that. This is not a comprehensive list of how you go through your ideas, but this is really a robust list of how to think through ideas. The one we all know about is brainstorming. That's just getting together with people and saying, okay, here's our target. Here's their needs. Again, in the marketing overview presentation, we'll talk about insight development and how to really understand your target so that you can come up with ideas that resonate or fulfill their needs. But we can brainstorm. The next one is what I would call outsourcing, which is looking to others to build ideas for you. So a lot of companies here might have a broad based stroke of an idea, but they can hire R&D firms, they can hire strategists, they can hire marketers like me. I will get hired sometimes to help people with innovation exercises. You can really find great ideas from outside of your own thinking. Sometimes we're too myopic in our own thinking. The next is competitor products. This is great. I worked on Horizon Organic. Tuber is here, an incredible product for us. Brittany, what does this product look like? I'll put you on the spot. What does this product look like we sold it from? Not officially. <laughs> uh, What's that big your play brand that they have out there? Oh gosh, uh, it's escaping me. Okay, well, Gogurt, I'm gonna feed it to you. So. <laughs> Yogurt uh, is obviously a tremendously successful product. Well, how did we take that learning? Well, we took essentially their product innovation idea and brought it into our organic, healthier version. Customer input is one I want to spend a few minutes on because customer input is so, so valuable. The first place is from your own consumers and your own customers, listening on social media. If you pay attention, consumers are very willing to give you thoughts on new ideas. And maybe the actual idea they give you is not great, but what can you take the core essence, the innovation, the insight from their idea and turn that into something new? Or your supply chain. This coffee flower is a realistic example. When I was running Abbott Nutritious Snacks and running the bar business, we had suppliers that created coffee flower. It's a byproduct of making coffee. It goes to waste. It's incredibly sustainable. It's incredibly nutritious. And that created ideas for how we could launch new products as well. So there's ideas all around you. You have to be open to them. And then, of course, internal R&D, which is for the companies that are able who have R&D staffs or even an R&D person. Or it might be you doing the R&D as it was for me when I first started. How do you continue to innovate using the supermarket if you're in the food channel is a great way to go in and see what flavors are trending, what products are emerging, what trade shows, what newsletters can you be a part of? These are all sources of ideas. I highly encourage you to sign up for newsletters from your industry, from your products, because you will be um, absolutely amazed by the robust ideas that come through there. And the final one here that I'll spend some time on, again, again in the marketing overview is licensing. But can you take your product and partner with somebody else to create a whole new line of products? So International Delight has creamers. They partnered with these different entities to create new flavors, leverage the power of the brand of Almond Joy or York, and created a whole new category and product uh, platform. As you think about innovation, it's critical that we think about the market around us, right? We need to think about what's happening, what the impacts can be, and what that leads to. Because what, what, what worked yesterday may not work today and may not work tomorrow. So let's look at some of these macro environmental factors, right? We have culture, demographics, political, legal, et cetera. And you'll see that all of those circle around the target. Because again, everything is about your target, how your target interacts with the macro environment. Not how somebody else, how does yours? So if you think about this as an example, COVID being the most robust example of amazing change in our macro environmental world, how kids interacted with COVID is very different than how millennials versus baby boomers versus Gen X interacted with COVID. Each experienced COVID in very, very different ways. And thinking about how that impacts your product, your service, your go-to-market plan is absolutely critical. As an example, I will say this. If those of you who know what we call brick and click, that means retail shopping, going to your local Kroger, as an example, is how we used to all grocery shop. Well, Instacart came about, which is where you can order groceries online. Kroger has a system where you can buy groceries on their website, pick it up. Those things were really designed and developed for millennials. Well, when COVID came around, the adoption for Gen X and baby boomers was unprecedented. 
the adoption cycle rapidly occurred in a way that I don't think it would have in any other way but COVID. Being thoughtful about that, being understanding of what that impacts your business, your innovation is absolutely critical. So those are some really important things to, to think through. And as we move forward, if I can get my slides to move, there we go. We want to think about the evaluation of results. As you get your testing that we're going to talk through, and this is kind of pre-launch slash post-launch, as we grow, can we make it at scale? Do we have the resources to make it? Do we need to take in funding? Do we need to find somebody else to make our product? What's our go forward plan? Because you don't want to build a business and then run out of resources to continue growing it. Do the consumers like it? This sounds obvious, but you'd be amazed by how many companies overlook what consumers are actually saying and just focus myopically on what they think and how they feel about the product. And then finally, does it meet your company's financial requirements? I.e., are you making a profit? What type of profit do you need to make? What type of financial structure are you trying to achieve? A nonprofit versus a for-profit company, as an example, have very different goals. So as you get through there, you're going to think about how do I learn if a consumer likes it? How do I drive this? Again, in the overview of marketing presentation, I spend a bit more time going into market research testing, but we're going to start here. There's two types of market research. There's primary research and secondary research. Primary research is first hand, i.e. I directly ask somebody. It's my data, it's my research driving the results. As an example, I could take a poll with Johanna and Latasha and Brittany and ask them questions. That's primary research because I'm conducting that research and I can learn. Within primary, there's qualitative research and quantitative. Qualitative is basically non, it's basically non numerically based research, i.e. what do people think? What do they feel? What are their reactions to things? Quantitative research is kind of the hard black and white. What do the results say? I did a survey, 15% say Y, 85% say X, et cetera. It gives you much more tangible data, but it doesn't give you the opinions. It doesn't give you the qualitative nature. So for instance, I could take a poll with the four on the Zoom with me right now and say, how many of you like the color blue and get a result? I'll get, you know, let's just say 50% result. That's quantitative. Now it's great to follow that up with qualitative research and say, why? What is it about this color? What is it about this flavor? What is it about this packaging that you like? The downside of primary research typically is that it's more expensive and complicated to do than secondary research. You have to invest your time, your resources, you have to create the surveys, you have to execute the surveys, you have to analyze the results. It's much more comprehensively involved. Secondary research is research where you go out and you use things that already exist in the marketplace. So Google, I mean, I'm not sure how many of you have heard about this Google thing, but there's a lot of great resources on Google. And so you can search pretty much anything and get research that's already been done. This is newspaper articles. It's research reports. It's surveys that have already done by others. So if I go out there and I search, what is the percentage of people that like the color blue? I will get results, I guarantee it, that tell me something. The downside to secondary research is rarely is it dedicated to exactly what you need, how do you trust the way it was executed, and really understanding that, and then knowing that it's a little bit more broad-based and not as focused as you might need it. And finally, that everyone else has access to that same data. So everyone else has access to the same material that you do. So on the right here, you can see a few different ways to do different uh, executions, secondary research, and primary research, time, cost, et cetera. There's ways to do everything cheaply. And as an example, focus groups. People typically think of focus groups in that two-way mirror. You hire a research study person. You got you to gotta find people. You sit in a room for three days. It costs $50,000 to do that. As an example, with the pop, I went on to our local website, our next door website, which a lot of you guys have heard of probably, our local Facebook pages. And I recruited participants who fit my demographic and psychographic needs, and we did backyard focus groups. And I paid them with product or $5 gift cards. You'd be surprised at how willing people are to give their opinion. People love giving their opinions, as we all know. So let's jump to what a concept test looks like, because I mentioned that earlier as part of the secondary uh, part of our launch process. So idea generation, concept testing. This is part of your research. This is where you take your idea, 
you put it into a document that allows you to test via survey, via focus group. Again, this can be quantitative or qualitative, depending on how you execute this. But again, it gives you an idea of people respond to your offering in a favorable way. And it allows you to ideate. So a big CPG company like a General Mills will literally test hundreds upon hundreds of concepts. They'll then narrow it down to let's call it 20, 30 concepts. They'll redo them and they'll keep redoing the concepts until they get it what they call right. And then they move on to the next step. In our world as smaller companies, we may not do a concept test. We may just talk about it or you can do a quick survey via SurveyMonkey or whatever, get the execution, hear what people have to say, and then move on to prototyping, launch, et cetera. So there's a lot of different ways to execute on this. Now, it's really important to take your research because even the biggest companies fail at research. And so this is one that I love to see that Coca-Cola, obviously we've all heard of Coca-Cola, as they launched in China, clearly didn't research their launch with the Chinese market because Coca-Cola is translated into bite the wax tadpole, um, which I don't think is a appetizing indulgent beverage for the Chinese market. So even the biggest companies fail at this, but that's why it's really important to make sure you're thinking through who your target is and what their needs might be. The next part of innovation I wanna talk about is kind of risk and versus reward. So all of you guys watching this have taken a risk by doing what you guys do. But there's always the more risk in theory that you take, there should be more reward. And as you think about growing your business, there's a couple of different ways. There's a line extension, new product and disruption. A line extension is essentially taking your product and launching a new flavor. So I have, I happen to have these in front of me, Parm, Chris, if you can see, this is the everything flavor. If they launched sour cream and onion, that would be a line extension. If they launched it in a new size, it's a line extension. It's essentially taking your core value and just doing a slight migration from where you're currently at. It's the lowest risk because you already know that people like your core value proposition. They like your product. You're just trying a new flavor. So in the world, the examples I have here, Oreo launching Fruity Crisp Oreos is a line extension. And then when Apple launched a new version of their PC, it's essentially a line extension because again, it's not new to the world. It doesn't change the way people are interacting with their products. Now, new products are the next level of risk because you're still taking off the core value proposition that you currently have or are developing as a new company, but there isn't really that tried and true consumer experience. You don't know how people feel about this product. Does it really link to your core value? We'll talk about some examples of failures later today and why those failed. But again, it's a bit of a departure from where you're currently at. Oreos is known for what? a cookie with cream between two cookie shells, essentially. Well, they launched into cereal with our Oreo O's, which was a licensing deal with Post. It's a new product leveraging their core proposition. Are consumers going to accept Oreos in its cereal form? Who knows? When iPad went to the iPad mini, as an example, that is a new product, but in the iPad launching is a, as uh, an extension of the iPod, Again, that's a new product and how people interact with that. Does that resonate? Do people want to carry around hand tablets after they got used to phones? Now, the most risk, the highest risk in innovation, but also the potentially highest reward is when you disrupt a market. It changes the way people think about their environment. It changes how people interact with their environment. You know, Apple, it's interesting because you can think about Apple doing this in so many ways, everything from the iPod to the iPhone, et cetera. But even the most classic examples used, and I typically use this in, in marketing, is Henry Ford. And you'll see this later, but Henry Ford took what the transportation was of the day, which was horses, and he created a car. That is a huge disruption in the marketplace, a huge risk. Will people adopt it because it's a new way of interacting with their environment? And of course, that worked out. In Oreo's case, the best example I could find would be making Oreo furniture. Um, which is a bit of a departure from their core. But Apple, obviously, with the Apple Watch, again, I can pretty much list every Apple product out here as a disruption product, but they are really good at understanding. And why Apple succeeds at disrupting the marketplace is because they really understand their consumer value. And we're going to talk a lot about consumer value here in a minute. So this is kind of that value, risk, and reward. As we think about innovation, there's a couple of key decisions we have to make, and it's product, branding, and packaging decisions. 
I've been talking a lot in that last slide about core customer value. What is the problem you are trying to solve? What is the issue that consumers are looking for? It's the benefit that people are going to do this. So Brittany, I'm going to put you on the spot again, if I may. Uh, you travel a fair amount, I think. And so when you go travel somewhere, what do you need? Um, you need something to, to as a place to stay, right? Yes. Right. So when you're looking at a place to stay, what is the benefit? Not the product. What is the benefit you are looking for when you look at a place to stay? Um, I'm looking for a place to sleep comfortably. Right. So, perfect. It's a you're, The benefit is you need somewhere to sleep. That's it's that simple. You need somewhere maybe where you feel safe and you can sleep, right? Yes. Now we're going to take that benefit. We're going to convert it into an actual product because a bed and the by the side of the road doesn't really live up to that standard per se. So we need an actual product. And that actual product is converted into what are motels and hotels across the world. And so when we think about that, what's the last hotel you stayed at as an example? A double tree. A double tree. Okay. So if we think about a double tree, you could have probably stayed at a Motel 6, right? And it was a double tree. Or you could have also stayed at a Four Seasons, right? They all offer the same exact thing from a core benefit, which is they all offer a place to stay. What differentiates them is that they have a unique target. So who Motel 6 is targeting is obviously very different than who Four Seasons is targeting. And that leads to the associated and augmented services piece of this. And this is where I think people and innovators really fail to think more about their benefit because they think so much about I'm solving the consumer need. I'm providing a snack that people want. I'm providing a grain that they need to eat. I'm providing seafood that they want to eat. How are you differentiating against your competition for your target? So in the Four Seasons example, when you walk into a Four Seasons, you have hugely different expectations than you would than you would a Motel 6. The concierge, the, the quality of the linens, the room quality, the the soap, the shower, I mean, everything about that experience is different than Motel 6, which in Motel 6, your goal typically is, I just need a place, a safe place to sleep, right? And those augmented services are really, really critical in differentiating. And so I encourage every one of you, as you're thinking about your innovation, what are those augmented products, services, attributes that you're going to offer that differentiate you against your competition for your target market? The next idea, and I brought this up earlier, is co-branding and licensing. I'm a huge fan of this particular area for a few different reasons. Um, and the one on the right, I used to be the chief marketing officer for Mrs. Fields and TCBY. And you can see I did the co-branding licensing on the right with the Bakeware collection. We also were a part of the Mrs. Fields Briars Blast, which you can see on the bottom there. And I also worked at White Wave, which owned International Delight. I didn't work on that team who did this, but I was around the team that did it. What's really powerful about licensing is it allows somebody whose core essence, their core competency is one thing to quickly extend into a different product group, a different category, or quickly take advantage of brand awareness. So I'll kind of talk through each one of these in itself. The Mrs. Fields Bakeware. Mrs. Fields' core essence is sweet indulgence and baking. Mrs. Fields doesn't do bakeware. They make cookies. That's what Mrs. Fields does. Well, there was another company that's core value was making great bakeware. And they said, look, we don't really have brand awareness. Mrs. Fields has great brand awareness around baking and indulgence. We want to take your brand and put it on our products. They make the product. We gave them our name. So we have the licensor. They were the licensee. It worked for both of us. For Mrs. Fields, it added an incremental category that we sold in, incremental revenue. For the other company, it obviously added brand awareness and kind of free marketing, so to speak. And so that's the power of licensing in one example. The next two are really about flavor optimization, extending flavors quickly. They eat Briar's Blast, which has great recognition in itself, could have made cookie dough ice cream and could have made uh, cookie ice cream and, and you know, knock off M&M ice cream. But obviously the power of brand is critically important. We talk about brand value again in the marketing overview, the power of brands is immense. And so adding that value. Now, there's a couple of things to think about if you get into licensing, which I encourage you guys to consider across the board, making sure that you really ensure that your brand character, your brand value is maintained. So for instance, we could have handed over the Mrs. Fields 
uh, branding over to the stakeware company. And if we let them, they could have marketed it, changed our logo, et cetera. We want to keep it cohesive. And you'll see in the direct marketing presentation that I do, that cohesive advertising, cohesive marketing is absolutely critical. So that's one of the things you have to watch out for, but it's obviously very entertaining. And again, licensing doesn't have to be around flavor or brand. Uh, brand tie-in. As an example, think about what McDonald's does with every Happy Meal. It's always the latest movie. Those characters have nothing to do with French fries. It's just bringing brand value and innovation to their to their what you would call stale products. A great example: Doritos Locos Tacos. I don't really eat Taco Bell. I will say I've been always craving trying one of these Doritos Locos. Thankfully, I haven't uh, uh, indulged yet. But they took the same taco they always have, and it immediately allowed them to extend into 123 different flavors by partnering with Doritos. The power, and it created newness. It created excitement. People lined up for days to try this. The power of co-branding is real. The next area I want to go into that's really, really powerful and also, I think, incredibly undervalued is packaging. The power of packaging can change your brand success. I'm going to go through a couple examples here. Again, I worked at White Wave, which at the time uh, owned silk, soy milk, silk almond milk, et cetera. When you do blind taste tents against Calafia, which is the brand on the top right here, silk always won. Product to product, silk always won. When you put silk's product, which is the standard gable top, like what orange juice used to come in, against what we call the round bottle uh, of Calafia, what you found was that Calafia always scored better on taste, on premium nature. People thought it tasted better because it was in a different bottle that looked more premium. Packaging has impact. Packaging changes the dynamic of how your brand is perceived. So that's a Calafia example. You think about oranges, a commodity example here, and we're gonna talk commodities on the next slide, but if you take oranges, which is essentially a commodity, They've packaged it in a way that makes it convenient for people to take it on the go, to put it in their cart, put it in their fridge, put it on the go. That changes the dynamic of how consumers interact with that product. And a great example is Chobani Flips. I mean, this is game-changing innovation for the yogurt category. Back in the day, right, it was always yogurt or the fruit on the bottom or fruit in there that you mixed in. This allowed us, this allowed Chobani to essentially create indulgence create that, that, that frozen yogurt, the ice cream experience of adding toppings to the yogurt and allow customization in a way that consumers really, really enjoy. So packaging is powerful and can single-handedly, as I say here, build or destroy brands. Now, a lot of us on the presentation work in what you know, are called commodity categories. So how do you take a commodity and you say, how do I market that differently? So here are some examples that really are powerful in the commodity space of how brands took things that were commodity, com, com, commodities and built brands around them. Bob's Red Mill is a great example and feeds them well because I know a lot of people do grains here. They essentially created blends and then marketed them as such. So you had almond flour, they put a brand around it, they put a face to it, they put a branding around this product. They packaged it differently than how flour was typically found by gold metal at the time. And then Bob's continued to innovate with, they had paleo mix. They would have the keto mix. They continue to elevate their innovation by creating blends that really worked well for their consumers. So it's really important that these consumers are seeing branding creating around your commodity product. Cuties is a phenomenal example, right, of taking essentially a clementine orange and creating a persona, a character, a value to this product and putting something around that. Again, change the game. Cuties is the number one selling in that category. Teton's Water, Teton Waters Ranch, grass-fed farmer in uh, just outside of Jackson Hole, found the opportunity to really build a brand around people's knowledge, love of the Tetons, put the packaging around it, and again, took a grass-fed meat category, packaged it into a brand, and developed great sales within the Kroger, Costco's of the world, et cetera. So taking commodities and building them into brands is very, very powerful. And it's something to think about. People get hung up in that I'm a commoditized business. Well, put a brand around it, put a value. One of my favorite things is made up marketing. As an example, if you think about Dannon and what they did with their pro, probiotic yogurt, they created, they had a strain of probiotic that no one would be able to understand. And they created a brand called, I think, Digestive Regularis. 
That's not a real thing, but it sounds official and it's a brand that people resonated with. They took something that's somewhat commoditized and they put power and value around it. As you think about innovation and packaging, there's a power of your branding around that. You'd be surprised by how powerful the word new is, new and improved, new. Uh, all of those different adjectives really have power on your branding. So I would highly encourage you on anything you launch that's new, really speak loudly about it being new. I believe the regulations in the marketplace are that you can leave new on a product for about six months from launch, give or take. Obviously explore that with your quality and regulatory teams but the power of new is impressive and very, very valid, validating to consumers as they try different things. In the direct marketing slides, I'll talk about how to communicate new, how to drive awareness of new and how to really get newness out in the marketplace. So let's talk about some winning innovation. These are great examples of how brands took their core value, extended them into other categories that resonate. So baking powder, if you think about baking powder, what is the core value of baking powder? Well, the core value of baking powder is really freshness, smell. It feels like it cleans things really well. It adds that kind of supercharged cleaning element. And so then they went into categories that that worked with. Cat, uh, kitty litter, deodorant, laundry detergent. They took what they knew was their core value, extended it into other categories. They also do it as co-branding. You'll see with the power of baking soda, with the power of Arm & Hammer on other products as well. So they've kind of leveraged it both ways. Snickers, taking how many people do you know that take a Snickers? And in fact, in my freezer right now, I have one for my son who take a regular Snickers and put it in the freezer to make it hard and, and almost like a candy, ice cream candy bar. Snickers saw that, they listened to their consumers and they migrated that into ice cream bars. Listening to consumers, watching how they interact with your product is really, really powerful. Going back to the Horizon tubers, we found out and we heard from a lot of our consumers that they would take tubers, freeze it, and then use it as the item to keep their uh, lunch, their kids' lunch boxes cold until lunch, and it kind of perfectly melted by lunchtime. And so what we did is we took that learning and we essentially created freeze, a tubers freezer box, and it's essentially the same product, just marketed different, incremental value for our consumers, higher profitability. And then finally, Clorox, again, known for cleaning, uh, sanitation, et cetera, obvious for them to go into places where a Clorox was already being used in terms of cleaning bathrooms and sinks and things like that, put it into packaging that people liked, put it into a value that consumers wanted, higher profitability. Let's talk about failures. These are kind of fun ones that I love to hit on. So the first one, Brittany, I think you might like this one is Jello salad. Uh, I definitely look at this and maybe at one point this would have worked, but, uh, I don't know, Jello with pimento olives. It looks like there's some cheese in there. I'm not sure this really resonated because it's stepped too far away from the core value. What is the core value of Jello? It's sweet desserts, puddings, gelatin. They stepped too far away from that. The next one I'll talk about, which I find really interesting actually is Heinz easy squirt. They did this in a lot of different colors. And so they did this in purples and pinks, and they had all kinds of crazy colors. I would argue, and we'll talk about timing here in a minute, I would argue a lot of this had to do with timing because at the time they launched this, it didn't really resonate with how consumers were shopping. They weren't ready for this type of product. So timing is a big one. Lifesavers, again, taking this core value proposition. Now, this is one you could argue actually meets with the core value. It's a sweet, it's fruity. Why not make fruit juice out of it? Well, this one, they didn't do their consumer research because moms, the primary gatekeeper, lashed out. Too sweet, too sugary, didn't resonate. It felt like they were giving their kids candy uh, as a drink, which the irony is that most fruit juices are essentially the same amount of sugar. But again, that consumer perception didn't work. Next one, um, Brittany, what do you use Colgate for? Brushing my teeth. Would you like to eat frozen chicken by Colgate? <laughs> so Colgate frozen chicken <laughs> Again, for obvious reasons, I think didn't make sense. I can't even understand the thought process on this one. Maybe after eating this, you needed to brush your teeth more. I don't know, but that really didn't make any sense to me. And then finally, Cheetos uh, lip balm, is, or one more after this one. And then Evian water bra, thinking, hey, Evian stands for water. The time water bras, I guess, were a popular thing. Again, a brand extension that didn't work. 
These are fun examples, but failures happen all the time. I hate to say this, but 85% of all new products will fail within the first three to five years, 85%. And so let's talk about how to prevent failures, or at least how to try and prevent failures. I have said this over and over. I feel like I've been repetitive, hopefully enough that it's gotten through. The core value is critical. Does your innovation fit with the core value of your brand or the core value of your product? Does it make sense to sell what you're selling? Don't speak to yourself. Ask consumers. We can always convince ourselves of something to be true. Listen to your consumers. Listen to the consumers of the target group that you're going after. Does it make sense? Do consumer perceptions link to the innovation? So let's use that Colgate example. Maybe that Colgate frozen chicken was the best frozen chicken on the market. It could have been. But the perceptions around the brand of Colgate match frozen chicken, obviously no. And right. And so understanding how people perceive your core value proposition. The next one is, is kind of interesting because you can argue this one, but refrain from extending the brand into too many products too fast. And what this basically means is give your brand time to build. This is especially true for most of us who have limited budgets, limited resources, limited time. As you launch into new categories, one of the reasons brands fail is because we don't give them the resources, the time, the nurturing to grow. And so if you're trying to go into too many places too fast, you're clearly not giving the resources. Now, a brand or a company that has millions, billions of dollars to support it in multiple teams, that's different because each team is giving that particular new innovation time to nurture. Be very thoughtful about extending into it. So in the food category, many of us work with a buyer in a grocery store as an example. So I work with a snack buyer. If I want to launch into frozen foods, A, that doesn't make sense with my core value, but let's put that aside for a second. If I want to launch into frozen foods, not only do I have to add resources to developing it, launching it, marketing it, I also have to develop a whole new sales team to interact with the frozen food buyer. Different refresh timing at the grocery store, different metrics are, I'm held accountable to, different profitability. It's so much more. And so really being thoughtful about that. And then again, is the brand extension too far away from the core value of the product? Does it make sense? And I mentioned this on the last time. I think a huge one that we all forget about is timing. Sometimes a brand launch and innovation fails. It just wasn't the right time. And so being very thoughtful about that, is this the right time to launch that? Did I miss the time? Am I too early? How do I think about that? Some of this is luck. But a lot of it has to do with being very thoughtful about what the consumer needs state is, what the target wants and needs, and how to really go through. So that's some ways to think about brand failures. Um, now, we're going to talk about some case studies as examples, because I think they can help you think through innovation from companies big and small. So we're going to do some big companies, then we're going to do Kapop to round it out. You think about Kapop, so I say remember the three C's because again, that's something in the marketing overview, but the three C's are company, competitor, and consumer. So as we always think about innovation, we want to make sure we're thinking about those three things. What's my company good at? What's my consumer want? And what are my competitors doing? Well, in the macro environmental world that we talked about at the very beginning, we know health and wellness has grown tremendously. So since 2004, carbonated soft drinks have shed 1.6 billion cases in volume. Uh, and so declining dramatically. The core essence of Coke and Pepsi have declined. If you really think about how many people you know nowadays that drink kind of classic Coke or classic Pepsi, it's probably very few and far between, let alone the sodas as we know and move towards more health and wellness diets. So what are the core competencies of Coke? What, uh, Brittany, again, putting you on the spot, what do you think some of the core competencies of Coke are? Um, recreation. Recreation. So being a part of how people experience their lives, right? That's absolutely one of them. You think about what they make. What do they make every single day? At, at a higher form, not soda, but what's kind of the, what's what's a soda? It's part of a what category? Uh, soft drinks. Soft drinks and beverages, right? Beverages, the yeah. beverage category. I'll leave you there. Um, <laughs> And so they're part of the beverage category. And as we think about beverages, right, they know how to make beverages. So what do they have in their plants? What does their company have? They have the ability to make beverages. They have bottling capabilities. They know how to distribute beverages, et cetera, right? And so as they thought about their core value propositions, they looked out in the marketplace. 
They saw that consumers wanted health and wellness. They knew their products weren't selling. They knew they had the capabilities to meet that. So what did they do? They went out and either innovated or bought the ability to go into that. They, they went into Dasani water, right? The growth of water, coconut water, honest tea, Adwala on the Coke side, Bublé or bubbly on the Pepsi, Naked, Aquafina, et cetera. They took their core competency. They knew what they were doing wasn't working and they moved into somewhere else. Silk is another great example of this. Silk soy milk. When I was part of the organization, silk soy milk really started to see a decline. It's because people's perception of soy, of soy really started to decline. People thought it wasn't good for them. It created issues, it, uh, GMOs, all of these things. And so they came up with silk almond milk. They came up with, hey, our core competency is plant-based milks. And so they went into cashew and almond and so on and so forth. That really changed the game. It actually saved the brand. Without silk almond milk, I don't know if silk would have been around. And so that launch really propelled silk into the next evolution and really created the whole plant-based category. That was innovation, understanding what they do well. Let's look at Kapop, my baby. So... Everyone just pretend like you love Kapop if you're watching this because it is my baby. But when we started, I again looked at health and wellness. I'm a fitness trainer, uh, been in the food space. I love to eat healthy, but just like everyone else, and you can't tell, I'm six foot six, 270 pound guy. I love to snack, I love to eat. And at the time I invented Kapop, I was eating what I call a lot of those wanna be healthy popcorns, the skinny pops of the world and some of the other ones. And it dawned on me that, hey, I love ancient grains. Ancient grains are a very powerful grain, right? We all, a lot of us know what ancient grains are. We use sorghum in particular. I wonder if sorghum can pop. Threw it on the stove. It makes little baby popcorn, but pop sorghum as you want to call it. And I saw this as an opportunity. I started doing market research testing. First, does the idea make sense? Well, check, I did concept testing. and People love the idea. A healthier, more nutritious based popcorn. Who wouldn't love that idea? So that was my concept test. My next was prototype. So I started making this and giving it to moms and kids around the neighborhood and friends and family. And I started watching them. And I went so far, honestly, as actually to get retail distribution because I thought this was a game changer for it. So I had retail acceptances, but I started watching people interact. And the problem with pop sorghum, because it's so small, is it made a mess. My favorite example is at the, my son, who at the time was, I guess, at five years old, walked to a neighbor's house and I could literally see a trail of pop sorghum from my house all the way to his house or to the friend's <laughs> house. And so that was very concerning. And I saw that and I was worried that that was gonna be a problem. So we ideated, we transitioned and we took the core value, which is pop sorghum and went after pop chips, a platform that was successful because of the brand pop chips, but pop chips had lost relevance because it was fake and baked and all these things that didn't really make sense. So we created Kapop Pop Chips. I mentioned at the beginning that innovation doesn't stop at launch. We continually evaluated, continually evaluated, and we looked at our packaging, we looked at our format. You can see in here that the chips are very narrow. They're kind of like wafer-like. Well, we learned that consumers wanted them thicker. We also learned on shelf that as much as this was unique packaging, it didn't really pop. We also learned that, hey, one of the fastest growing areas in the salty snacks category was puffs. So we continue ideating and you can see the difference in the chip, right? Chip, chip A or chip B to chip A. You can see how the packaging got a little more colorful, a little bit more vibrant, really reflected that essence that we were trying to go for. We didn't stop there. We saw this and we said, you know what? We can do even better. And we migrated into this packaging. This packaging came about entirely from backyard focus groups. We said, there's a better way to do this this isn't popping the way we want it to on shelf. We want to have a little more pop, no pun intended, off the shelf. And so we brought consumers into our backyard and we ideated, we ideated until we came up with this. This packaging was a game changer for Kapop and really led to extended distribution, retail awareness, because again, we didn't stop. The chip continued to improve. The flavors continued to improve and so on and so forth. Now, I will tell you, every innovation we did around flavor really came around by looking at what was happening in the marketplace, what trends were exciting. Spice is a trend. Churro was a trend. So instead of calling it cinnamon, we called it churro because that was a trend we saw in cereal, as an example. In January, we decided that we wanted to continue attacking the salty snack space. So after a lot of research, we came up with two ideas and we ended up launching our Kapop rings. This is a better version of Funyuns. 
tastes just as good, but it's a healthier version. Again, backyard focus groups, nothing more, concept testing, nothing more, and then a lot of eating samples until we got it right. Now I can tell you, we have uh, been recognized as the fastest launch on Amazon Grocery in 2022 with the Kapop Rings. All of this innovation didn't come from millions of dollars of research. It came from just talking to consumers and looking and listening to the marketplace. That translates into a future innovation that we haven't launched yet, which is Kapop Scoops. So don't tell anybody. We're, I'm going to trust you guys on this one. And then one of the other things we see in the marketplace that is really exciting, Brittany, in October, where do you see everywhere? What does Starbucks launch? What's the flavor that everyone goes to? Pumpkin spice. Pumpkin. Pumpkin. Everyone <laughs> loves pumpkin. And we saw how powerful seasonals could be. So we launched pumpkin. And in fact, today literally was our first day producing pumpkin for this year's batch. But we continued to see that seasonals were powerful. And so we started kind of really going after seasonals. So last year we did pumpkin spice and gingerbread, which are coming back. We're launching hatch green chili uh, on August 8th, s'mores in October. We're continuing to ideate around innovation and seasonal. All of this came from listening, watching, and talking to our consumers. I can tell you the total research budget for all of these changes probably cost me maybe 500 bucks, maybe a thousand bucks, not making the products that's different, but the research part of it, just by giving gift certificates out to consumers, asking people to respond to surveys. It's incredibly powerful for innovation work. So I hope through this presentation, it sparked a lot of thinking. Obviously this innovation uh, presentation was at the 30,000 foot view. There's a lot more nuance to it. And I'm always happy to help. Here's my email. You can reach me through this email or through uh, the council of, of, um, that you work with. And I'm happy to help and look forward to talking to you. I hope you got a good sense. And uh, that's the innovation presentation for today. Thank you so much, Dustin. That was an excellent guide to innovation. And if any of you have any questions, please reach out. You have Dustin's contact info and we can also direct you to him for any further information that you're searching.